Welcome to the Career Now Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Erwin Tan. Erwin is an Associate Professor at the Graduate School of International and Area Studies at Hancock University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, and he is also the author of the book, The US vs. the North Korea Nuclear Threat, Mitigating the Nuclear Security Dilemma, which of course is going to be linked below the podcast. But today, we're going to speak about something slightly different, and something slightly different for the podcast in general. This is going to be more of a meta-analysis. A look at North Korean research and how it is done, how it operates, some of the challenges, the successes, and importantly the methodology of triangulation, which much of the podcast is going to focus around, as well as focus around Irwin's article, Source Triangulation as an Instrument of Research on North Korea, which of course is also going to be linked below. Now this is an interesting look at the academic field itself, not just North Korea in general. For young scholars out there beginning their research, and for people in similar situations, this is a valuable signpost in that journey. It is a look in many ways into how you conduct research in general, but also the very difficult case of doing so for North Korea, with all the challenges of opacity, misinformation, and often dramatically divergent theories, expectations, and analysis of data. I must warn from the outset though, there is a little bit of background noise in the podcast, but it doesn't continue throughout, and it doesn't really affect the listening experience at all. And instead of digging into the details of the podcast now, I might jump straight into it and open them up through Erwin himself and let him explain the details, the dimensions, and the importance of this kind of research. So on that, and to walk us through source triangulation as a means of research in North Korea, this is Erwin Tan. Erwin Tan, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Hello. So I might get you as a very first question here to introduce yourself and your research. Now, I don't often do this, but we're going to speak today about um, methodology, research methodology and triangulation. So just to give people an idea of uh, how this may intersect intersect with you and your life and your research, just uh, might get you to introduce yourself and where you're coming from here. Thank you. Well, um, my name is Erwin Tan. I hold the position of Associate Professor at the Graduate School of International and Area Studies at Hankook University of Foreign Studies in Seoul, Republic of Korea. Um, well, I was introduced to the idea of source triangulation as a distinct form of uh, research methodology when I was working in my PhD under Nicholas Wheeler and Graham Davis at Aberystwyth, 2004-2008. So given that you know, North Korea is probably one of the most opaque subjects that you can imagine, it's extremely totalitarian, exercises a high level of censorship. Um, most observers cannot go, get into the, into the country to do any meaningful observations about the country. So the result then is that I found source regulation to be one way of bypassing the challenges faced in um, trying to undertake any meaningful research in North Korea in terms of getting data. So that's one form of source triangulation. Uh, but if you look at the work of, say, Norman Denson, who was uh, one of the major proponents of source triangulation, well, he also uh, points that there are a number of other different ways through which you can undertake the process of source triangulation. So um, if you have had a chance to read my book, The US versus the North Korean Security Dilemma, published by Routledge 2014, I also adopt uh, what can be considered theoretical triangulation namely a comparison of offensive def uh, offensive realism, defensive realism, and constructivism as distinct approaches to analyzing the patterns of the U.S. North Korean security dilemma. So that's the um, theoretical uh, triangulation, which uh, so then yet yeah, another type of triangulation involves investigative triangulation, which comes in the form of multiple and different uh, researchers working at the same pro at the same time on the same project leading to co-authored articles, books, and book chapters. So the resulting benefits is that one, it allows the average researcher to get additional data about North Korea. Two, it helps to provide different perspectives, which then help to mitigate the element of bias. And three, if done with the right uh, co-workers, it also leads to a massively increased level of research output, 
So let's jump into, I suppose, where you started there with the question of uh, sources and uh, I suppose the opacity and the, the censorship inside North Korea. And we'll walk through some of those stages that you mentioned there. So let's start at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And this idea that it's incredibly hard to get insights into North Korea. Now, many people know this instinctively, of course, but this is something you've been dealing with yourself on the ground. So just how tricky is this as a phenomenon to get insights? Because you mentioned here that they are, they are ranked, of course, incredibly low at the bottom of uh, press, uh, press freedom. But there are sources that come out of this country. So the places like the Rodong Shinmun and the KCNA. So how do you deal with this idea that you are looking for information from this country and also dousing it at the same time? A good point. Um, I don't rule out the use of North Korean media sources, but of course, uh, you know, the element of state bias has to be acknowledged. So in this sense, one, uh, one element of the process of, of triangulation that I do employ takes a look at you know getting material that is available from KCNA and Rodong Shinbun. But at the same time, um, I also need to qualify my review of it. So one thing I do is to cross-verify the data between North Korean sources and sources from international media. That's one area. Then I can see how the different sources portray a given event. Say, uh, if you're talking about, say, the implementation of the 1994 Agreed Framework, KCNA and Rodong Shinwon are going to have their North Korean approach. I can compare that with, say, you know, CNN or Sydney Morning Herald or BBC in how they have reported the US side of the Greek framework. Then I can also add a further level of triangulation by reviewing the material from various scholars and authors who have worked on North Korea. Don Oberdorfer, Robert Gallucci, Leon Sigel, etc. And this also is another form of triangulation, given that, you know, I'm consulting scholars who come from a range of different backgrounds and different perspectives. So again, it helps to cross-verify the data between different sources. It helps me to filter out the potential for, for human or politically driven bias. It helps me to sharpen my objectivity. So what do you make, and you do mention it here in your research, which I am going to link below for everyone listening, and I will link uh, Irwin's book, which he mentioned earlier just there as well. But uh, you mentioned this idea of travel to North Korea, and of course you do say here that it's hardly hardly to be expected that uh, North Korea is going to welcome any foreigners, or especially foreigners that are going to pry into their lives. So how do you see the idea of tourism or at least uh, people going there for exchanges as an insight into, into North Korea? Is this particularly useful in your regard or is it something that is a, a significant challenge for research? Um, it's helpful in some ways. Uh, I've not been to North Korea, but I do know a number of people who have. Uh, basically, the closest I've been to North Korea was at a North Korean-owned restaurant in Vladivostok, Russia, last year. Now, I'm aware that it's possible to enter North Korea as a, but the extent to which uh, the average researcher can get hold of meaningful data, it depends on the subject. Uh, so in my case, I tend to work on the security side of things, the North Korea's nuclear and missile programs, the political ideology of uh, Ju Che, Son Gun, and uh, Byung Jin, that sort of thing. So no, there's no way I can expect to get a media interview with Kim Jong-un um, if, I, if I ever went to North Korea for, for whatever reason. So in as far as the hard security side is concerned, um, there's not much I can do in North Korea except, except being a tourist. And even so, I would have to be careful if I want to avoid the fate of an auto Um Having said that, uh, I do have some friends and colleagues who have been able to undertake some level of research in North Korea, but they're taking a different focus. Uh, so for instance, um, say people, uh, some scholars who work on, say, the role of non-government organizations in North Korea. I know a few people who do that. And they've been able to touch base with various NGOs such as the Red Cross in North Korea, which then gives them some level of insight into the grassroots level of things. Um, say human rights scholars. Um, yeah, I know one human rights scholar has made it to North Korea. She's been able to get some data. But even so, it has to be you know, through a lot of back channels through NGOs that happen to be in North Korea, and which are only going to talk to her on the basis of complete anonymity, that sort of thing. Uh, so what about the diplomatic element to this? Because a lot of diplomats beyond the scholars themselves do get access to Pyongyang and do get access to some circles that uh, scholars do not. So this, I'm assuming, has to be a quite a rare insight or a useful source of information, but it must also come with a certain amount of um, 
I suppose, caginess in some regard, as in these diplomats, if they come out and start uh, openly writing and speaking about North Korea, they may struggle to get access again in the future. So how do you pass and how do you deal with this uh, this particular source of information from diplomats? Is it easy to get a hold of? Are they happy to speak about this sort of information? And is it particularly useful? Yes, uh, I agree that it's extremely useful to get hold of these insights because of you know, the fact that a lot of these people have been directly privy to many of these direct dealings. But as you say, it's quite, they can be a bit cagey at times. So what I've been relying on is to get a hold of the, you know, uh, diplomats and statesmen who have been basically been retired. So the fact that they're retired means that they are no longer that uh, beholden to keep state secrets. Um, say, for instance, Gallucci, Robert Gallucci, who co-wrote uh, Going Critical with Joel Witt and uh, Daniel Pullman, the uh, first North Korean nuclear crisis. Right, um, Goluji was directly involved in the 1993-94 negotiations with North Korea. So going critical was a really key text. Um, when I was writing my PhD back in uh, uh, back in uh, 2007-8, I had a chance to meet Goluji in Georgetown University in Washington D.C. So again, fieldwork interviews with statesmen and, and diplomats who have been retired provides additional insight. Um, but yeah, so getting hold of Gallucci, uh, Mitchell Rice, who was involved in the concrete framework, Stephen Balls was another key man, man uh, Marion Creekmore, who accompanied Jimmy Carter to the in, in, into North Korea in June 1994. You know, so talk, uh, getting hold of various uh, retired diplomats was really helpful in the sense that not only the, the books and articles they've published, but also the getting hold of them directly for interviews for uh, in person, via email, by telephone, etc. So let's uh, delve, delve into the uh, triangulation itself and some of the intricacies of this, because this is what the or particular part of this research is, and you talk about how useful this is as a way, as a methodology in study in North Korea. So let's start with something you mentioned at the very beginning, but we'll dig into it a little bit more here, which is uh, chronological data triangulation. Mm -hmm. Now, you did mention that, I might get to introduce it again, but you say here, and this is quite interesting, that it is something that you find very useful when dealing with uh, long time frames and, and and I suppose time periods that stretch out for a number of years. Yeah. Okay, so if we consider, say, a period that has been, you know, ongoing for decades, right, say the Cold War or the US North Korean standoff. So if you have something that has been going on for a very long period of time, you have got the uh, political transitions on all sides in Pyongyang and Seoul and Washington, D.C. So being able to take a step back to look at how the different uh, heads of states have been interacting with each other. This allow for a, a, an ability to identify the trends that underpin their interaction. I mean, it allow, it's allows for you know a, a review of say the different U.S. Uh, strategies in attempting to undertake uh, North Korea uh, to enforce the uh, non, uh, nuclear non-proliferation regime against North Korea, for instance, or within the context of say the ROK's different uh, leadership transitions. It allows for a review of the various uh, South Korean approaches to North Korea, whether it's the, the um, you know sunshine policy under Kim Dae Jung and Robo Hyun or Moon Jae In's engagement policy versus the more hardline approach adopted by Lee Myung Bak and Park Geun Hye. So uh, from that, you mentioned and you touched them just earlier. And so let's stick with this uh, chronological triangulation for a moment here. And you mentioned Don Oberdorf, which for many people have quite a, quite aware of him. It's often their first book that they pick up when it comes to North and South Korea. And you speak about uh, his revisions of his famous book, The Two Careers, mm -hmm. as being a very important uh, example of this type of triangulation. So I might get to in, 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 not just introduce Don and his book, but introduce just to, uh, the change changes he made over time and why it was so important? Mm -hmm. Well, in this, in this case, uh, Oberdorfer and Korea go back a long way. Um, he was in fact um, actually posted to South Korea and with the US Army just after the Armistice Agreement. And shortly after that, he then stayed on as a journalist for Washington Post. And he also became an academic along the way. So the fact that he was actually that much of an eyewitness observer to many key events on the Korean Peninsula means that he had a very, very rare insight that was able to reflect over the different um, periods of inter -Korea, uh, of Korean Peninsula affairs over the course of his life. Uh, by way of example, um, he was in fact an eyewitness to the 1974 assassination attempt on Park Chung-hee as an example. So um, in this sense, the fact that he was you know, a, a direct eyewitness to several key events, as well as having a very sharp 
analytical mind, meant that, say, in the 1997 and 2000 editions, he was able to come up with a cautiously optimistic appraisal of the situation in, on the Korean Peninsula. I mean, we are talking about, you know, the agreed framework and the U.S. Uh, North Korean Joint Communique of 2000. But then if you look at the more recent editions of the two Koreas uh, following the revelation that North Korea had the highly enriched uranium program, the transition to Kim Jong-un and the uh, a continuing uh, coerc uh, adoption of coerc coercive postures towards North Korea, it therefore leads to his rather more pessimistic appraisal in the more later editions. So, and you also mentioned an uh, important scholar here, Van Jackson, and uh, I will link the book below that you mentioned here as well. And he has done a similar fit, uh, theme here. He's stuck in the same kind of triangulation. And he has uh, quite interestingly moved through different ep ep uh, episodes in U.S.-North Korean relations and tensions. So uh, what has Van Jackson done? Why has, how has triangulation worked for him in this regard? Well, uh, Van Jackson tends to take a look at the idea of diplomatic uh, reputations in the coercion process with it between the U.S. and North Korea. So his first book took a look at why the reputation that the U.S. and North Korea have for towards each other for coercion and diplomatic bargaining power does matter in various res um, historical instances, say the uh, North Korean siege of the Playboy, the axe murders incident, etc. So based on this, then, he was, he was therefore able to identify key patterns in North Korean negotiating behavior. One thing that should be noted is that uh, in, the course, in the context of Van Jackson's first book, we have um, the bulk of his of the interaction between North Korea which, which came under the period under Kim Il-sung. But of course, as you know, Kim Il-sung passed away in 1994. So I think it's necessary to put some level of qualification on the research implications that Van Jackson draws in his first book, given that you have the transition to Kim Jong-il in 1994 and then to Kim Jong-il in 2011. But the thing is that the, Kim, the, the three Kims in, in Pyongyang have, are essentially operating within the same overall foreign policy and military establishment in Pyongyang. So regardless of who's the leader in charge, there's still going to be the you know, uh, officers from the old guard who are still going to guide each and every successive great leader along. So in this sense, I think it helps to identify the key underpinnings that, that essentially guide North Korean diplomatic and geopolitical strategy. So let's push on here and uh, touch on uh, perspective-based data triangulation, so a new form here. And uh, you say, and this is quite important here for a lot of scholars coming up and a lot of scholars getting involved here, that this is an important way for, uh, I suppose, it, acknowledging or I suppose identifying your own biases and be and beginning to be able to remove them from your own research here. So this is one of those things in social sciences that everyone has this great problem with trying to identify their own biases. So how does perspective-based data translation work in this regard and why is it so useful in removing that particular part of uh, uh, research? Um, good point. Um, well, the thing with uh, perspectives-based translation is that it's very closely uh, tied up to the, necess the necessity of observers being able to separate facts on the one hand from analysis and opinion. So if you consider how you can have different perspectives that give you a given period of, say, US-North North Korean interaction. Well, if you have, um, say, a range of different sources coming from different ideological or professional backgrounds, you can then, as uh, if you look at the diagram on page 40, the objective is to focus on getting the hard data, the raw material. Now, bearing in mind that all of these different sources are going to have their own distinct interpretation of the data, it becomes necessary for the researcher to separate the, you know, the uh, the wheat from the chaff, the uh, data from the noise, the extraneous noise, identifying which data might be might have been incorrectly or inaccurately identified. So, in this sense, then, it's one way of getting hold of additional data. But at the same time then, it also becomes necessary for the researcher to bear in mind that all of these different perspectives have their own respective biases and perceptual assumptions. So it's this very intricate dance between the researcher and his sources, because you know, being able to identify the cause and effect analysis process of his sources, or I'm sorry, his or her sources, versus the researcher's own uh, separation of his or her own facts from his or her own analysis. Uh, 
So it's a very intricate dance that's always ongoing. It's uh, quite a bit of a challenge at times, but so it therefore requires a bit of uh, experience to pull off successfully. So this is brings us to a point which you put in your research here, which becomes very, very important, I suppose, at least and very much so in modern day academia and modern day social media as well. And this is what you write. You say um, referencing potentially controversial sources should not be mistaken for being an apologist for any political view. So I might get to open up exactly what you mean there, because this is one of those things that um, makes people quite nervous. So this idea of source triangulation that we're talking about involves, as you mentioned, they're bringing in a lot of different sources and feeding them off each other. But of course, we live in an environment today where as soon as you bring in a source which could be quite controversial or they could hold some private view which people find distasteful, suddenly you're being labeled with them as you are in the same camp with the same ideas and you are somehow uh, tarred if they have some sort of uh, background which may be unideal. So that's open up that point there of why it's important to separate the research and the data from the people and the and the, and, the, and the opinion in this regard. Um, good point. Uh, a while ago, sometime, um, there was a viral meme indicating some of the common logical fallacies made by people in the online world. And one of those was to avoid ad hominem attacks, in other words, direct attacks based on who an observer is. Now, in the case of North Korea, it's a bit hard because um, I mean, the extent of the biases in North Korean media sources is, is there. So what I try to do is to, whenever I review the data, I bear in mind that it is, after all, the North Korean state media. But at the same time, I try to focus on the hard facts that, say, KCNA and, Ron, and, and the other North Korean media sources are putting out. Um, I guess I alluded to this earlier in the sense of, you know, being able to cross-reference the data from North Korean sources with data from mainstream media, mainstream scholars, this therefore allows me to filter out the um, perceptual biases, the assumptions, etc. Um, at the same, um, I also have to do likewise with various Marxist scholars who also take a very pro North Korean view. People like Tim Beale and Gavin McCormick, who are extremely hard left. But in this sense, then it's a, uh, it's quite a challenge because uh, at one stage I did in fact cite a rather leftist uh, perspective in a conversation with a center-right American scholar, and it was a bit of a challenging conversation. Basically, I just had to keep focusing on, I'm not taking anyone's side, I'm just trying to provide my analysis, my review of hard facts and hard data. So just as an insight here into the field itself, beyond those those moments where you do crash heads with people over small uh, instances and references like that, how do you find the field in this regard? Are they tend to they tend to be quite open and accepting of this idea that you are simply bringing in new data that should be analysed if it's only to eventually denounce it or remove it or at least offer a counterexample, or is it uh, is is there some fear floating around? How is it in general beyond those few moments where you do hit heads with people. You mean, when you're talking about the field, do you mean the field of other observers on North Korea? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, good point. Um, well, as you can imagine, the uh, far left scholars uh, do not, are not amused by my research perspectives. And likewise with the, the conservative scholars, in fact, uh, I, tend to, I would tend to characterize myself as mildly left of center on some issues and mildly right of center on other issues. But with North Korea, it's just such a polarizing factor, but uh, such a polarizing case that quite often you have got, you know, extremes on either side of the spectrum that essentially regard my research as rubbish. So, um, but I think there's also a bit of a caricature at times. I mean, there are quite a number of other scholars who adopt a mild, you know, largely centrist or left of center, right of center sort of perspective. So uh, once I'm able to identify the scholars who I'm able to actually have a constructive discussion with, then it becomes a lot more fruitful. Um, I suspect that one reason why some scholars tend to take an extreme viewpoint is that it's one way of boosting their their publicity, you know, the way they can on the uh, within the academic field. But um, I also think that that is not exactly consistent with the idea of scholarship. I mean, scholarship is not about trying to advance one's own personal agenda or ideological bias. It's about constructive engagement based on cause and effect analysis. So, uh, yeah.
Let's bring in George W. Bush here, because if anyone is going to make things controversial, it's going to be the idea of an ex-president making comment here. And you talk about the, we've spoken about the Greek framework a few times. And this is, uh, you talk about George Bush and his analysis of this. So this might be an interesting example of what we've been speaking about here as perspective-based triangulation. The idea that George Bush saw, and he wrote in his memoir, of course, every president writes a memoir these days, and he wrote that North Korea was likely operating in a secret highly enriched uranium program Kim had cheated on the framework and you run through this and you and you play it off against what Clinton what 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 the Clinton admi- administration said and did what Colin Powell had said so oh, let's open up that episode here and George Bush as a as a source of this type of triangulation mm-hmm. yeah well the thing is to bear in mind is the uh, the underpinnings of George W Bush's worldview I mean, if you think in terms of the neoconservative perspective back in 2001 onwards, the whole idea was that they actually believed that they had some God-given mission of promoting democracy at gunpoint. Um, and in, in addition, I think it's also helpful if you think, take into account the ideological roots of the neoconservative movement, right? Um, I'm not sure if you know this, but it actually started out as a kind of an alliance between uh, the Republican Party and a bunch of disillusioned Democrats in the 1970s and 1980s after the disaster of the Vietnam War. So they had a bunch of these disillusioned Democrats who still believed in the idea of promoting democracy at, 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 by force, as well as the you know existing um, notion of American exceptionalism about promoting democracy and, and the like. So much so that when um, it came to the when these matters converged in the form of Judge W. Bush, they ended up with this worldview that essentially placed the 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 white the U.S. government as the entity that could do no wrong. But as I pointed out elsewhere in the article, uh, if you look at, say, the fact that the Clinton administration had fallen behind the implementation of the Greek framework in the first place, uh, it therefore reflects that, yeah, if you try to take things from the North Korean point of view, they had reasons to be suspicious about the U.S. Uh, sincerity behind the Greek framework. They had reasons to hedge against the uh, possibility that the U.S. would not fully agree to f- a great framework, hence the the uh, Tepodong missile test in 1998 and the HEU program. Uh, I had a conversation with Leon Sigal back in 2007. Uh, I butt heads with Sigal as well because he's quite a bit too leftist with my taste at times, but he does make a very interesting point. He Sigal pointed out that it was in only 1997-1998 that you had these two developments. The Tepodong missile test and the highly enriched uranium program, which therefore suggested that from the North Korean point of view, it was a perfectly logical thing to do, to hedge against the um, the continued hostility of the US. So let's step into the an, another category of methodology here, which uh, of triangulation, which is uh, method, methodological triangulation. And as you mentioned earlier, you did introduce this briefly already. Uh, you say you, of course, people might be aware, and uh, this is quite familiar to some people, the idea of um, differences between primary and secondary sources, which might need a brief introduction here. But you also mentioned this is quite interesting for North Korea. You say there is a category here in North Korean studies which doesn't fit either primary or secondary sources. And that is the kind of information that comes from people like uh, uh, Wang Yang Yop and uh, people like this. So I might get a reintroduce um, method, methodological triangulation and then re- and then introduce this idea of this category, this information coming from certain defectors, which doesn't fit either primary or secondary source information. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if I understand your question correctly, you're talking about the defectors themselves. Yes. Okay, good point. Well, if you consider people like, say, Huang Zhang Yop and uh, Tae Yong Ho, well, in as much as they were, after all, key figures in the North Korean political establishment, they can be seen as primary sources as far as their understanding of North Korea was when, uh, you know, in the period that before their defection, right? So, given that Huang Zhang Yop was uh, central to the crafting of the Juche architect, uh, political ideology, yes, yeah, I think it's fair to, to describe. Uh, Huang Zhang Yop as a primary source, in as much as the idea of you know any study of Kim Il Sung era Juche is concerned. But if you then consider the fact that Huang Zhang Yop continued to make statements after he had defected in 1997, well, in that case, then what Huang Zhang Yop had to say about say Kim Jong Il was more of a secondary source, no? 
Yeah, yeah, I suppose so, yes. Yeah. So how 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 do you pass this kind of information? How do you do how do you deal with it? Is it a a challenging thing because you do mention at a later point in your research here how uh, there's a problem and we we will come to this a problem of defective testimony here which is to, and you mentioned uh, uh, YOP as well here which is the idea that despite all the information that comes out of them when they do defect and it is so valuable once they've been in the country for a few years and they begin to speak sometimes you begin to realize that some of the information that's coming out is just not what you expect it to be so this is a huge challenge in North Korean studies I imagine this idea of dealing with defectors and dealing with the idea that it is incredibly fraught and difficult information to get your hands around because it's often inaccurate which is a shame to say Good point. Um, I guess this also goes out. Uh, my solution to addressing this thing is comes in the form of perspective triangulation, as I mentioned earlier, right? Being able to cross uh, cross verify the data from different perspectives. Um, so in the case of Hong Zhang Yok, Hong Zhang Yok, one of the examples I like to cite is that uh, at one stage he actually uh, went forward to say that North Korea hadn't stopped uh, working on this nuclear weapons program, but uh, shortly later. There was this uh, article in the New York Times in which he admitted that he had no basis for making his claim in the first place. So this one way I try to get around this by you no, know, not taking uh, anyone's statements at face value, whether it's the North Korean media or North Korean defectors or anyone else. You know? So it's not about taking stuff at face value, but rather in form of reading in between the lines and to consider the possibility that a given uh, source, whether it's a primary source or a secondary source, may have made a, an error in the process of cause and effect analysis. Admittedly, it's, there's no perfect solution to this. I mean, in the social sciences, there's no such thing as 100% objectivity, right? I mean, I have my own assumptions and my own biases as well. So the best I can do, which is I point out in the towards the end of my article, is to regard the idea of source strangulation as more of a risk management mechanism for managing data. It's not foolproof, but at least it's, it's a starting point for research. So let's ask a personal question about your own research, which you do bring in here, which is the book that you mentioned earlier, which I'm going to link, of course, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. versus the North Korean nuclear threat. And you've said here that you benefited significantly, significantly from being able to gather a critical mass of information from publications and notable U.S. Uh, interactions. So I might get you to open up your own personal story here, your own personal information with uh, methodological tri triangulation, because a lot of people listening, a lot of scholars out there, new scholars, may think to themselves, they may have a very uh, clear understanding of what the theory is, but it may be helpful to understand a personal story and just how you went about your own research in this regard and some of the challenges and successes you found here. Well, personal story. Um... Well, uh, the idea of the of triangulation as a research methodology was essentially outlined to me by Nick Wheeler, who's my uh, uh, primary uh, PhD supervisor. One of the challenges that we uh, I found was that there were so many different uh, interpretations of what the security dilemma was and what it meant in international politics. So one way of the resulting uh, butting of heads between me and Nick was that we ended up uh, he ended up suggesting that I try to adopt this review of you know, Offensive realism versus defensive realism versus constructivism in reviewing the US North Korean interaction as one way of trying to come to grips with the definitional debates surrounding the security dilemma itself. But based on the idea of triangulation, the, um, you know, both in the form of Nick telling me, uh, so, you know, providing me guidance as well as, um, you know, uh, as, as well as the idea of source triangulation being repeatedly emphasized in the research training segment of my PhD meant that I just found that it was one way of getting hold of additional sources of data. Because as we were discussing earlier, North Korea is not going to be particularly forthcoming when it comes to data. I mean, you know, having to read between the lines of you know, when it comes to North Korean sources and the like. So in this sense, then being able to get hold of new avenues of data, new avenues of research was helpful in bypassing the fact that, yeah, North Korea is not exactly forthcoming. Um, I think the other factor that I also found to be quite useful was in the sense that uh, you know being able to piece, uh, piece together a full range of books and journal articles. Well, it meant that it was it was able to get a whole of this much data from different scholars, which meant that if say a given bit of data that I needed to advance my thesis or my research was not available, well at least I have alternative channels for getting the data that I do need. 
But as I mentioned, it's not a perfect solution. But uh, I don't think perfect solutions exist anywhere anyway. So uh, from that, let's walk into some of the challenges that come through triangulation and some of the ch challenges that are inherent here. So the first one you mentioned here is um, information overload. And of course, for many people, this makes some sense. You start to triangulate as much as you, as you possibly can, and suddenly you're flooded with this critical mass of information that you can't process. So uh, what exactly is this, is this information overload and uh, what is the best way to overcome it and what are the challenges it presents? Okay, well, information overload is, as you said, you know, occurs when you have to cut us an observer collecting too much data. I mean, and this is especially dangerous in the online world because there's just tons and tons and tons of data out there on the, on the internet. And even with North Korea, this can be even more challenging because uh, North Korea has managed to make it uh, turn itself into a bit of a PR uh, uh, case study, you know. Um, that whenever one, uh, some people want to get attention for stuff, they and one North Korea is a very popular source. So if you look at there are publications such as the so-called East Asia Tribune, which uh, carried the story about the supposed assassination of Kim Jong Un a couple of years ago, there's one pitfall that you've got too many hacks and uh, snake oil salesmen who are trying to cash in on North Korea. Um, so in the last section of my article, I do point out to a number of ways where you know, it's possible for, for it's possible for the researcher to come to grips with in mitigating the impact of information overload. One is that the one useful way that I've been trying to tell my students is to keep a sort of a shopping list of material that they actually need for the research process when they are undertaking source translation. Have a sort of a shopping list of, okay, say North Korea and Juche, which therefore means Huang Zheng Yop and Kim Il Sung ideological underpinnings of North Korean state philosophy since the 1960s, uh, work by B.R. Myers, etc. Right? This means that the if you consider these as the list of the, the shopping list for stuff that is relevant for a thesis on Juche, that helps to filter out other things like say famine in North Korea, which is occurring in the same country, but it's a rather unrelated matter, right? Uh, this so that's the one. Second, as I mentioned earlier, the importance is on separating the facts from the analysis. Because the danger that I find, in, in, even in, in my present day interaction with many young students, is that there's this tendency to present facts as analysis, which is not the case at all. Facts is essentially the raw material of any research process, but it can be interpreted in so many different ways. So in this sense, then, one thing that I keep repeating to my students is, here's the facts. But you also have to separate how other scholars and other commentators have analyzed those facts. And at the same time, okay, students, what is your analysis and opinion about that? So um, that's one, an initial way I try to get them to you know, separate the facts from the analysis, right? How challenging is that to get them to do that? I imagine this must be a, a difficult process. You mentioned here imposter syndrome, which is this idea of um, uh, junior scholars being uh, trying to assimilate senior scholars w uh, work into their own. So how challenging is it to get uh, fairly new researchers to go out there and in some ways analyze, but also dismiss the work of senior scholars if they can? It is it's extremely challenging because um, you know, apart from imposter syndrome, the tendency for a lot of young researchers is to become, is to risk feeling intimidated by these more senior scholars. So I, I think the best way of trying to overcome the threat of imposter syndrome is the, of the observation that you learn by doing. The more you do it, the more you get. So in this sense, it's a case of experience, you know, over time, just learning to overcome the sense of, uh, you know, the possibility of feeling intimidated by other senior scholars. Because I myself, um, when I was younger, was constantly, uh, you know, constantly faced the, this imposter syndrome, this feeling that I would never be able to measure up to the, the big guys. The thing that kept me going was this push to keep working at it, working at it nonstop until I finally got around it. So in this sense, you know, the whole uh, point about perseverance and persistence against uh, you know, this seemingly unsurmountable challenges just as relevant to any young scholar these days.
So let's move on to the Rashomon effect here. And this is interesting. It's uh, it's a book by Akira Kurosawa, at least Rashomon is. So it's a movie and it's also a book. Uh, and it has, it's one of those very interesting learning things that people always uh, mention here. It's really quite fascinating. But for people outside of academic fields and outside of particular film and artistic circles may not know about this. So uh, you, I may have to get you to introduce just what the film is itself briefly and then to introduce what the effect is and why it's such an important thought experiment for young scholars. Okay, well, the Rashomon uh, was a 1950 uh, film by Akira Kurosawa brilliant uh, black and white summary, samurai flick. So it basically is a situation in which uh, you have got a number of different uh, verifiable um, bits of evidence. In the film, uh, you have got a dead samurai, his widow, a bandit, and a lost dagger. But you then have a in the film itself, points out that there are four different perspectives. The bandit story, the samurai widow story, the samurai speaking through uh, a medium, uh, I'm sorry, the, the samurai spirit speaking through a medium, and a, the, a woodcutter who has seen the, apparently seen the whole thing. So the fact that you've got these four different perspectives, each providing a plausible and logical explanation for the same phenomenon, meant um, even though each of these four different perspectives actually contradicted each other the whole time. Um, so the, the, the risk of this then, of transplanting uh, of the Rashomon effect within the process of source triangulation is most likely to occur when you have got young scholars who present facts as analysis, even though they might be presenting materials and perspectives that are contradictory to each other. So this is one reason why I, I, try, I have to, I repeatedly emphasize to my students that source triangulation is not exactly, is, uh, no, I'm sorry, that source triangulation is nothing more than a tool for research. Because if a tool is, mis is mis misapplied for the research process, the results are not as advertised. If I may go back to the, if I may use the an analogy of tools, right? Okay, supposing you are trying to uh, cut a wire, you're not going to get very far with a hammer. You use a wire cutter, right? Likewise, if you're trying to hammer a nail into the wall, using the wire cutter is not going to result in the effects desired. So in this, within the context of the source triangulation as a tool, the danger is that is, is putting a bunch of tools at the same time without a proper understanding of how they actually work. So I think it's more helpful for researchers to remember that source triangulation is nothing more than a case of getting hold of data from a range of sources, but at the same time remembering that those different sources and those different perspectives have their own pers their own assumptions and biases. So it's a, re it's a really it's quite a challenge to be for the researcher to be able to separate you know the facts that are being focused on through the evidence that's being gathered from source translation from the perspectives that those data is being presented through. So let's move on to just that point there, that idea of some unreliable data, which you yeah. you put in some detail here. But of course, the focus here is not just people getting it wrong or people making mistakes in the field, but people de uh, deliberately showing their bias, deliberately misinterpreting data. Now, this can be quite challenging here. So uh, this is a challenge I imagine for North Korean studies is quite uh, significant in some regards, as in people have a lot of vested interest in seeing North Korea perhaps in certain light as uh, unreformable or as seeking peace. There is so many ways and so many scholars out there that seem to have vested interests in North Korean behavior. So what? how hard is this to overcome? And we mentioned a little bit before the idea of defective testimony here. So how, how challenging is the idea of uh, biased, uh, deliberately biased ac uh, academics and research inside the field? Um, it can be quite a challenge as well because, as you said, you've got some quite a number of people trying to promote their own agendas deliberately, even if it means uh, cherry picking the facts or you know using words that is meant to connote a given a deliberate meaning, etc. So um, I'm afraid there's no easy solution to this. You know, as, as I mentioned, the best way of coping with it is to learn by doing. Um, but yeah, I think it might also be helpful for. The young for younger researchers to constantly remember the whole Descartian approach to things, question everything, everything that is 
not immediately clear. You know, being with, with, um, a constant willingness to challenge one's own assumptions, bearing in mind that even whilst trying to be objective, one is still a human being observing a given social science phenomenon. That, that the reason is the result that is that it's impossible to achieve 100% objectivity. There's always going to be the interaction between the human observer and his or her subject, no? So how, uh, let's move on to a way to put this all together here. So with some final details and a way to really stick it all together and I suppose highlight the field and some of the challenges and some of the successes here. And you highlight some important things to remember for young scholars here and important things to remember when ed when entering the field and undertaking this type of research. And the first one you talk about is important of defining the case study. So what exactly is this and uh, why is it so important to keep such a clear definition of your case study? in this regard? Well, um, earlier I mentioned the importance of keeping a shopping list, right? This idea helps the researcher identify the key parameters that's going to define the research uh, uh, project. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you, if you, the risk of in all, uh, you know, uncontrolled use of source translation is that you result in an academic version of mission creep. Uh, mission creep is used in some military circles to refer to how, you know, mission A becomes overextended into mission B, mission C, mission C, etc. right? So in the academic context, mission creep would, could result in a research project starting about, say, the Korean War, but which then uh, ends up taking, taking a look at uh, the period after the 1953 Armistice Agreement into Park Jung-hee, into South Korea's economic miracle, etc., 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 even though the original research project was about the Korean War. So that's mission creep in the academic sense. So to avoid that sort of thing, the, the important thing for the research is to constantly define what is relevant to the case study, i.e. the Korean War. Keep a shopping list of what is necessary for answering the question. Say, the uh, factors leading to the North Korean invasion of the South, for, as an example, or the lack of uh, US credibility on the part of the ROK in 1950 as another, ex as another key element in the shopping list as of that the research has to bear in mind, right? So the whole idea of this shopping list is to essentially define the parameters of the case study to ensure that other data that is indirectly or, di or di indirectly or diagonally irrelevant is kept out. It helps to manage the data. Second, I think I mentioned this earlier, the whole idea of separating facts from analysis. The researcher has to constantly remember that the different perspectives that are being presented, well, that's just opinion and analysis, which may be incorrect. So it's a, it's a constant dance between the researcher and his and her or her material to constantly filter out the facts from the analysis. And I think the idea of the shopping list also helps. It helps the researcher to, to have a sort of a quick reference as to, to identifying, okay, what are the facts that are relevant to a case study and how are those facts being presented by other people? And I was thinking also, if you also think in terms of the importance of questioning the sources. Uh, I mean, if, if we consider, say, a given source that has a clear track record of publishing along a given ideological bias, well, it's possible for a good researcher to identify patterns of behavior coming from a given scholar in the field, right? So if you have a constant, consistent track record of you know, dubious uh, publications from a given scholar. It becomes necessary to avoid uh, material from that person, you know, to maintain one's own academic credibility. So that's actually a very interesting point here. I might get you to pause for just a moment on that because uh, this is one of those, for people unfamiliar with academia, it is one of those fields where reputation really, really matters here. And I suppose you touched on it just a sec there. It, it's really important in this idea that, uh, and you put a series of um, questions and uh, it's, uh, I suppose um, uh, signposts that people should follow here and research. And you say things like, is there a pattern to, to, to the statements and the analysis? It ha have, have, and things like look at the, um, academics previous publications look at their previous research how they have they've been skewing it and this is one of those fields academia where if for example you've engaged in plagiarism your academic uh, career is not so much almost over but it 
taints everything you've done afterwards. And a similar way in in that regard for this type of research here. So I might get to just have a, a little bit deeper look there at just how significant it is that reputation stands in this field and how someone else's or an academic's previous research, if that's been poorly done or poorly referenced or they allowed their biases in too much, will taint future research? Well, that's a very good, uh, tough question to answer, actually. Um, because on the one hand, uh, when a person already has a track record of uh, unprofessional academic behavior, it becomes harder for the wider community to take that person seriously. But on the other hand, uh, tr dooming a person to perpetual um, intellectual mediocrity based on mistakes that that person made in the past can also be a bit harsh at times because, you know, we all make mistakes. We all learn by making mistakes. So it's a very difficult, um, it's very difficult to, it's a very difficult fine line in the sense that, yeah, there are some scholars whom I have major disagreements with and um, I, but I also have a minute to agree with some of their source material at times. But on the other hand, if the overall track record of their publications and their worldviews is too biased for my liking, it's a very difficult challenge to try to ascertain what I can actually derive in from, you know, from reviewing their work. So again, one of the ways I try to overcome this is by diversifying my range of sources. We are going back to uh, triangulation by perspectives, right? Um, you know, not relying on any one source or excessively for my data. This allows me to, to provide me with a sort of a, a fallback plan to ensure that I'm not awfully beholden to any one perspective. Admittedly, it's not perfect, but uh, it does at least get, uh, provide me with a basis for getting work done seriously, no? So as a as we edge towards the end of this podcast here, I, there's another point that we haven't brought in here, which you mentioned as an important thing to remember at the end and one of the ways to look back on this source, on this idea of triangulation and method, methodology. And then you put this down as the cause and effect analysis and I suppose the the challenges and the, and the successes that come from that. So what exactly do you mean when you say cause and effect analysis and how does this fit in with the triangulation methodology? Um, good point. Well, if you look at, um, uh, in many ways, the idea of cause and effect analysis overlaps uh, very heavily with the idea of separating facts from analysis. So we take the facts of the, you know, the observable data, say statistics, quotes, verified historical events as the starting point of the material of the, re of the process of analysis. Well, it then becomes necessary for the researcher himself or herself to uh, consider how those uh, facts then relate to other observable data, right? But this is a challenge as well. I mean, there's no, it's going to be very, um, almost impossible for any two observers to have the same cause and effect analysis. We all have different assumptions. So the best way that anyone can do is to essentially provide the most logical explanation between event A and event B. Um, it's a bit of a challenge at times because um, also in my career, I've been, I keep repeating to my students, okay, you've got event A, the windmill is turning faster. You've got event B, the wind is running stronger. But no, event A didn't cause event B. The windmill does not generate wind. It's the other way around. So within the context of North Korea, it's a case of having to consider what our data is actually observable. Well, in terms of, say, North Korean missile and nuclear tests, media statements, uh, deliberate uh, 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 you know, postures within the six-party talks, etc., to the different possible analysis that can be can, that uh, that attempt to account for such actions on the part of Pyongyang or, or with Seoul or Washington DC. Uh, admittedly, there's no uh, perfect solution to this. We are not in the in the natural sciences where you can expect you know, a more accurate results. But the best that one can do within the context of the social sciences is to be rigorous with oneself in the cause and effect process. You know, being a, a constant willingness of reviewing the data to, to, to bear in mind that one has, that we as human observers are not infallible, that we too are capable of making mistakes in the editorial process. 
So as a final couple of questions here, as we've been speaking, it sounds more and more and reading through your research here that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds more and more like you uh, see this kind of triangulation and this kind of research, uh, almost like a, um, a countermeasure, a block, a protection from error in some ways. And this is very interesting in terms of uh, um, scientific data and scientific triangulation. I, I think you mentioned earlier the idea that you, you I think you called it risk management. So yeah. uh, how is is this the kind of frame in which people should see this kind of triangulation through? Um, I'm afraid it is actually because um, I, I guess that there's this all constant temptation to come up with 100% you know, objectivity in the social sciences. There's this desire for perfect knowledge, etc. But the reality is that the social sciences is extremely subjective. It's always going to be subject to human interpretation, biases, etc. Now, if we are in the in the fields of say physics, physics or chemistry, it's quite easy to measure the uh, chemical properties of a given chemical compound, or the or reaction of a falling object from a from a from a from a given location. It's easier. It's much easier in the natural sciences in that regard. But when you're dealing with the social world, you as human observer, observing other humans and other organizations of humans, there's just a massive range of possible interpretations. So much so that I think the risk management control mechanism, well, I, I mean, I do agree that it would be nice if, you know, we as human observers can come with 100% level objectivity in and separating uh, analysis of opinion from facts to achieving a Yoda level of wisdom, to put it in Star Wars terms. But the reality is that it's not practical in the real world of social science research. There's always, always going to be different perspectives, different interpretations. So I would say that the best we can do is to at least come up with the most convincing possible explanation of, for a given social science phenomenon. So as a final question here, uh, this brings back to North Korea and the field itself in general. And we've been through a lot of research methodology throughout the podcast and a lot of the details and the finer details. And I have to assume through writing articles like this and through building up this kind of methodology that you've done here, you must uh, have a keen insight into the field itself around you. So how positive do you feel about the field or how negative do you feel? You interact with other scholars, you see their their own research, their own methodology, you see what is out there around you. So do you see it, uh, are you generally quite positive about the field itself or are you quite pessimistic? I'm, I'm wondering how you see the overall North Korean studies field. Um, I'm somewhat more positive about it. Uh, because, I mean, I've, I have a good uh, range of uh, friends and colleagues who also do uh, similar research on North Korea. Uh, we do butt heads occasionally, we have occasional disagreement, but as long as we just keep it respectful between us, it's fairly, it's a pretty good working environment. And mainly the challenges come when uh, in interacting with various uh, scholars to take an extreme viewpoint. Uh, I've met a few of those in the past, but I do not interact with them on a frequent basis, so it helps to... Uh, mitigate the potential for fallout with uh, you know, somewhat uh, more uh, abrasive colleagues, I guess. Okay, so that is a, a good ending point, I suppose, there. that's uh, I'm going to introduce your article here, so I'm going to link it below. It's the article that we've been basing a lot of this discussion on here, and that's called Source Triangulation as an Instrument of Research on North Korea. The link will be in the description below. I encourage listeners to go and click on it and uh, read through it themselves. There's a lot more detail in there that we managed to get through today. So on that, Erwin Tan, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Thank you. Have a good day.